Hello, welcome to our viewers. I am Dr. Abhik Devnath. I am consultant urologist, andrologist, endourologist, laparoscopic surgeon, and renal transplant surgeon at the renowned Pace Hospitals, Hyderabad. Today, I will be talking about basics of renal stones or kidney stones. So, what are kidney stones? We have a pair of kidneys in our body. Each kidney consists of 1 million nephrons. Each nephron is the structural and functional unit of the kidney. So, it has a sieve which filters the blood and a coiled tube through which the filtrate passes and the urine is formed. In this process, if the salts get deposited in the collecting system of the kidney, it leads to formation of what we call as kidney stones. So, how these kidney stones are formed? Basically, it is analogous to how we mix salt in a glass of water. So, to a certain extent, the salt which is added in a glass of water will remain dissolved. But after certain amount of time and with certain concentration, the salt will not get further dissolved and will form crystals in the water in the glass tumbler. The same happens when our sh shower pipes get blocked with salts in our washrooms. In the same way, when the salt concentration in our urine exceeds the capacity of the urine to hold it in the dissolved form, it forms crystals which grows and ultimately forms kidney stones. How common is the kidney stones? So, here I would like to talk about two important terms. One is annual prevalence rate and the other one is lifetime prevalence rate. So, suppose in a population of 1000 people in an area, over a period of one year time, if we do scans in them and we find out stone disease, in 100 out of the 1000 people in the one year time duration, then we say that the annual prevalence rate in that population is 10 percent because it is 100 divided by 1000. And if in this 1000 people we follow for kidney stone development throughout their life period, then the number of people who develop kidney stones constitutes the lifetime prevalence rate. So, for example, if out of 1000 people over the entire period of their lifetime, if 200 people develop kidney stones, then we say that the lifetime prevalence rate is 20 percent. So, after understanding these two terms, based on global statistics, it is said that the lifetime prevalence rate of stone disease is about 10 to 15 percent. It depends on which geographical region we are studying. Regarding annual prevalence rate, it is higher in the western countries. In US, it is about 10 percent and in Asia and in India, it is about 5 percent. In India, stone disease in the kidneys is predominant in the stone belt states. The stone belt states constitutes Maharashtra, Gujarat, Rajasthan, Haryana and Punjab on the western side and Delhi on the north, Bihar and West Bengal and the northeastern states on the eastern side. Mainly these areas people have higher incidence of kidney stones due to the hot and dry climate. So, what are the types of kidney stones? Kidney stones are mainly classified into two types, calcium containing stones and non-calcium containing stones. Calcium containing stones include calcium oxalate, which can be either dihydrate or monohydrate and calcium phosphate. Non-calcium stones includes struvite, which are commonly called infection staghorn stones. Apart from that, the uric acid stones or cysteine stones or drug containing stones. So, what is the cause of this formation of kidney stones or who are at risk to develop kidney stones? To some extent, the development of kidney stones depends on the occupation and the place where the person lives or the geographical state. 
and also the climate of that particular region. So, it is as said, it is very common in hot and dry climatic conditions, especially people who are working in the fields who have a hot climatic condition are prone to develop stones. Apart from that, there are certain less common genetic conditions which predispose to stone formation, which includes primary hyperoxaluria, cystinuria, xanthinuria, and ARPT deficiency. Apart from that, there are some modifiable risk factors, which includes obesity and diabetes mellitus. Most importantly, one of the reasons which is claimed to be very important in the causation of stone formation is inadequate or less intake of water. So, what are the first signs of kidney stones? Most of the kidney stones will not cause any symptoms. It is incidentally detected on an abdominal imaging which is done for some other reason or vague non-specific abdominal pain or for some other cause. Commonly it is diagnosed on the X-ray abdomen, ultrasound abdomen or in the CT scans of the abdomen. Usually kidney stones do not cause any symptoms, but if they grow in size, they can cause obstruction and infection. Also, a small stone can drop down into the ureter and can cause obstruction and colic. How the kidney stones are diagnosed? Kidney stones are commonly diagnosed, as I said, in incidental abdominal imaging. However, to the first modality to diagnose kidney stones includes X-ray KUB or ultrasound abdomen. Most of the kidney stones, unlike gall stones, are radio-opaque. That means, they have a density sufficient enough to show up in an X-ray film because most of the kidney stones contain high amounts of calcium. The most common type of stone being calcium oxalate dihydrate. Best modality to diagnose kidney stone is the CT scan of the abdomen. In acute emergency situations, a non-contrast CT scan is enough, but for planning surgery and to know the functional status of the kidney, a contrast enhanced CT scan or a CT urogram is sometimes deemed to be necessary. Complications of kidney stones. Usually, kidney stones are incidental findings on imaging. However, they can cause problems. Especially in a diabetic patients, it can cause severe infections of the kidney. It can drop down and can cause obstruction and severe pain. Also, if the obstruction is not relieved in due course, maybe in a few days to weeks time, it can lead to irreversible loss of kidney function. Also, it can cause renal failure if both kidneys are affected with the stones. How to manage kidney stones? Kidney stones can be managed either by operation or without an operation. The decision to whether to manage a stone depends on many factors. It is not a straightforward answer depending on the kidney stone size. Many other factors have to be considered like the patient's age, patient's occupation, the location of the stone inside the kidney and other parameters which include the stone Hounsfield unit or what we call as the stone density, the body mass index of the patient, the skin to stone distance and the anatomy of the collecting system. These are just two enumerate a few. Sometimes people ask that I have a 5 mm stone or 7 mm stone. So, should I get operated or should I get treated? So, again the answer is not so straightforward. Usually, an unobstructed kidney stone of less than 10 mm may be safely observed. However, in those people who are in odd occupational conditions where access to health situation or access to health condition or access to health system may be inadequate should be ideally treated like pilots or navy recruiters. 
in them even a small renal stone should ideally be offered treatment. If the stone size is more than 10 mm and it is located in the kidney and it is not causing any other trouble, then it may be offered or treated by non-invasive means like extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy or ESWL. In this technique, a machine gives acoustic vibrations to the area of the stone under analgesia or seroanalgesia that is under sedation and the stone gets fragmented into small powder. The powder in subsequent course of time is excreted into the urine. Some medicines also help in the excretion of the kidney stone, especially when the stone size is small and they are located in the distalmost part of the collecting system that is in the distal ureter. These drugs include alpha blockers like tamsulosin or alfuzosin. Surgical treatment for stone disease includes mainly two modalities. One is through endoscopy which is called URSL or RIRS and through a puncture in the kidney directly on the back which is called PCNL or percutaneous nephrolithotripsy. In some scenarios, we may consider to remove the stone through laparoscopic surgery, especially when a concomitant laparoscopic pyloplasty is being considered. Open stone surgery, once in the past was very common, is occasionally used nowadays due to advancement of other surgical treatment modalities. Apart from these treatment options which I mentioned, there is another option which is available but that is restricted to only uric acid stone which is called chemolysis in which we administer alkalinizers to the patient to drink to make the urine more alkaline and to dissolve the uric acid stone and finally help it to excrete outside the body. Whom to consult when you have a kidney stone or acute pain arising likely due to a kidney stone. So, I would suggest in case of acute pain to consult any physician in hand so that pain prescription can be given. However, after the pain management, the definitive management of the stone is usually done by a urologist. For acute pain management arising from kidney stone, commonly used medicines include tramadol, paracetamol or antispasmodics like flavoxate. Some prefer to use NSAIDs but they have to be used with caution under the supervision of a physician because they can cause some kidney damage especially when the renal function is compromised. So, after stone management, how to prevent the recurrence of another episode of stone or how to in general prevent the formation of a kidney stone. So, the most important preventive measure is to drink plenty of water. So, many people ask that what is the meaning of to intake plenty of water? How much quantity is considered to be adequate or plenty? So, the simple answer would be that to drink that much amount of water which will make the urine look very clear and like water. But evidence wise if we consider a urine output of about 2.5 liters per day is considered to be adequate and for that about 3 to 3.5 liters of water has to be taken. Apart from water, there are certain dietary measures which are considered very important. One is to decrease the salt and protein content of the food. The usual recommended salt intake is about 3 to 4 grams per day and animal protein or non-dairy animal protein that is meat content of the food has to be reduced to about 0.8 to 1 gram per kg per day. Apart from this, there is a general consensus that low oxalate containing diet is beneficial. So, diet which has high content of oxalate like in a spinach, beet or in nuts 
has to be taken in low to moderate quantities, not in high quantities. And overall to suggest is that take high amounts of fresh fruits and vegetables and plenty of water and to take a balanced diet which should not have extra calories or protein. So to summarize, kidney stone is a very common condition and is mostly affected because of inadequate water intake or because of our climatic conditions. It's very important to know the early signs of kidney stones which includes pain, especially pain arising at the back and radiating to the groin downwards or sometimes a nagging pain at the back which comes on and off. When this arises, immediately consult a physician for pain control followed by consulting a urologist for the definitive management of stone. Stone management includes surgical and non-surgical modalities. I conclude by saying that all modalities of stone treatment are available in the best possible technologies at PACE hospitals. Thank you.